I guess it was about 1958 or so. I was 13 years old. Uh, never liked sports, stick and ball sports, any of that stuff. A friend had a homemade motor scooter down on Carlisle Street in Daytona Heights, and uh, he let me ride it. I was 13, and I just was taken by that. I went home and bought parts, bought one that somebody else built out of pipe. Uh, and this was before mini bikes. <clears throat> we built mini bikes in the 50s. I was the only guy in my shop class in ninth grade when I was 14 to weld, and the teacher never welded. They had a brand new Lincoln welder, and uh, he gave me the book. So I started making grapes and boogers and uh, uh, learned to weld. I thought, boy, if you could weld, you could just do anything. And after that came lathes and mills and drill presses. Uh, and I, I got in with a gang of gearheads uh, that rode whizzers in Daytona Heights. So I had a whizzer, had a couple of them, never paid more than 20 bucks for one, and learned mechanics and rebuilt my first motor. The whizzer had a rod knock. I didn't know what that was. I thought that was supposed to be there. And then an older guy showed me uh, how to how to put uh, new inserts in the crank on the big end of the rod. And things went from there. Um, <clears throat> graduated a Harley Hummer and then a Triumph Cub, which I rode the wheels off. Meanwhile, in between all this, I'd work in a machine shop in the evenings, a gas station in the daytime. And then I worked in a body shop, a high-end body shop doing mostly Corvettes and sports cars. And I learned glass work, and I, then I started doing Corvettes on my own. I'd buy totals and, and do them. But all the while, I still like to machine and weld and make stuff. And uh, never liked college, tried that for less than a trimester, I guess. And uh, just, just, just didn't fit in there at all. January 66, I went to work. I got a job at Alcoa, New Kensington, when it was booming back when there were 4,000 people there. The Alcoa buildings in New Kensington, which are now an industrial park, are called Works One. And that is the very first building. Charles, Charles Martin Hall in, invented aluminum, refined bauxite. Uh, that's where they built the first uh, aluminum plant. Around 71, I think, they, they finally locked the doors over there. Kind of sad at the Allegheny Valley was, you know, everybody drove uh, fast cars and motorcycles and, and enjoyed a pretty good standard of living because they worked at PPG, Allegheny, Ludlam, or Alcoa. Between those three plants, uh, if you got a job there, you had a job for life, you know, at the time, and, and you lived pretty well. In 67, I started racing, and I raced from 67 up until the mid 1970s, uh, and I ran, I had a Class C license, I flat tracked, road raced, uh, did some of the very first motocross in this area, was more like a hair scrambles, it was through creeks and everything else. My first racing was, started in 67 in uh, the Western Pennsylvania Scrambles Association, and these were really nice TT tracks, the nicest of all was Butler, uh, the Butler uh, motorcycle club that Andy's and Audi sponsored for years and years. They had a farm with a huge uh, TT track, a, a short dirt oval, and a dirt drag strip. So after a few years of that, I, I applied and got a Class C license, and I started a flat track all over the Midwest with, with not much success. I was getting older, and it certainly was a, a young man's game. And I mean, if you're 28 and the guy next to you is 18, that that's a huge, huge difference in flat tracking. Um, I remember remember racing with the Springsteen brothers. Everybody knows Jay, but he had a brother, Ken, who was equally as good, but I don't know, know whatever happened to him. Uh, I got to race some road racing, Daytona twice, rode Atlanta, uh, Pocono, and uh, that was a lot of fun. But the, the dirt on the flat, flat track, dirt track is... You know, a wise man once said, look in the dictionary under the word race, and it'll say flat track. Uh, that everything else is just something else. <laughs> in about 75 or so, 74, 75, 76, I, I met Eric Buell. And we, we started a little business in my mom's basement called Kitzburg Performance Products. 
Uh, Eric's father was a patent attorney, and he helped a guy that invented alclad uh, aluminum. Then that, uh, those are the, the pots and pans utensils that are aluminum inside with a thin sheet of stainless on the outside. And then it revolutionized cooking, I guess. Well, Eric, he said, these have got to make disc, disc brakes for road racers. He was so racing oriented. The guys at Road Race are really nuts on, on weight and uh, things like that. And so we, he would get sheets of that and would cut them out and made um, disc brakes for, for different uh, Yamahas primarily. Eric was really funny, and he he was um, uh, he was really a driven person, and but he was haphazard. I couldn't slow him down to, you know, I'm a tool and die maker, so I do things very methodically, very neatly, uh, you know. And Eric would just, uh, you know, slap stuff together and do this and do that. He was an incredible rider, as as many of you. Uh, no, he, he was a fantastic rider. He rode too hard. He either crashed or won. If we go to the races, like we went to Daytona, and um, my bikes were all wash waxed uh, parts in the van, everything loaded perfectly, toolboxes, and he would shovel all his stuff in the van. He said, well, it's, you know, it's a 15-hour drive. I could put the bike together in the van going to the races. You know, <laughs> that, was typical, uh, that was typical era. Eric, you know, but uh, he he got a ride from Harley Davidson in those days. Harley Davidson and many people don't even know this. They they bought a uh, an Italian company and they they sold a road racer called the RR250. They had an Italian rider and then uh, the famous Triumph rider uh, and Harley Gary Scott rode one, and Eric rode one. Uh, they weren't as reliable as the Yamaha, but they handled as well. And Eric uh, he was at the forefront of that. In those days, Eric was a pretty free spirit, and one day he said, you know what, I quit all this, I'm going back. He had uh, nearly got a degree in engineering at Pitt, and he said, I'm, I'm going to finish my degree, and I'm going to go to work for Harley-Davidson, and I ain't going to make Fat Bob tanks. <laughs> I didn't see him for 20 years then, except on the news and the magazines and his success. So I went on my own. I, I had a little lathe at home. I uh, got a little milling machine, and I just started making parts. And I, my, my dream was to have my own machine shop. It was rocky for, for quite a few years. And um, then I was able to build this building on, on the family farm, add on to it several times, had a high of uh, 10 or 11 employees, and I managed to run the shop for 40, 40 some years here in this building. And I retired at 72. In the early days of my business, I, I did a lot of uh, motorcycle machine work. I started cylinder boring and crankshaft rebuilding and a, a lot of things like that. But I always had a separate little shop um, aside from my big shop. And uh, I always laughed. Some, somebody would say, well, next door there's a, a little place with a mill and a lathe. And uh, <laughs> it's next to this big shop. And I said, well, when I go in at night to... Uh, make something for myself. I can't find anything. I get mad and I fire everybody. But luckily, I calm down by morning. So I have my own shop at home where all the tools are laid out. I'm a little nutty and uh, I can find everything. <laughs> From those days, the late 60s and into the 70s, uh, how many great people I knew that, that had small shops, uh, cottage industry, I guess they call it, and did fantastic work. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll say to a, a younger person, well, why don't you build a, a hot rod or a, a chopper? And they'll say, well, gee, that costs too much money. Well, there's a way you can, you can do stuff and you can build stuff if you really want it, you know, and if you apply yourself. And that's the way it was growing up, I guess, is you might have wished you had a brand new Harley or you wished you had one, you know, a car or something. Uh, so you worked your way up. People just want... They want this one first. They don't want a ratty old Yamaha that they can paint themselves and fix up. No, I just want that one. There's nothing in a Harley showroom I want, but if you tell me about a box, some boxes in the shed, man, I'll beat you there, you know. And then it was that fun and that personal pride that you, you took a basket case and you made something out of it. You know, any, anybody can go buy one of those, but you've got to build one of these. And that's the difference. Way back when, 
there were garage builders everywhere before the pros took over, uh, especially bikes and hot rods. You had to have friends that did all the different things. And uh, you knew somebody that usually from high school hanging out with gearheads, you say, well, this guy's a really good welder. And he loves to, to weld bike frames together. Over the years, I've had so many motorcycles and not too many new ones, believe it or not. But I've uh, I mean, I had a brand new one. I, when I was 18 years old, I bought a brand new Triumph Bonneville in 63. Love old Ironhead Sportsters. I just sold one. Uh, I just like to look at them. Um, I call it 60s style with straights, small tank, black, seat and pad, short bars. Chopper behind me is definitely one of my favorite bikes. I built that uh, with the help of a dear late friend, Albert Moore, and I built that. Uh, and it's a brand new Harley motor and Yaffe frame and tin work. After I, I got rid of the business and I had had a little bit of time, it seems like I, I'm busier now than ever, uh, I had an opportunity to buy a couple Triumph 500s that had been sitting out. So I scooped those up and one's finished, uh, the purple one we looked at earlier. I loved Triumphs when I was a kid and uh, I took a particularly liking to the Cubs. That was a 200cc little trail model. The, the story behind Cubs, the only little bike Triumph made was the Terrier. It was a, a 155cc and it was really a dog, like eight horsepower. Good for commuting in London. And the American distributors in California and in Maryland of Triumph back in the 50s, they said, um, late 50s, they said to Triumph, you have to build a better little bike. We wanted something you can trail ride, ride short track, uh, desert ride, you know, and all that. And they talked them into bumping up the horse, the displacement to 200 and redesigning the looks of the bike. And so around 60, the uh, bike just, just turned into this great looking motorcycle and it got nicknamed the Baby Bonnie. It was a stepping stone because the bike only cost six or seven hundred dollars. If you bought one of those and you rode the wheels off at delivering papers or whatever, you wanted a 500 next and then you wanted a 650. The older guys like myself really like them and feel an attachment to them. In the, the early 70s when I did motorcycle work, uh, I, I had picked up a dealership for a, a dirt bike made in uh, uh, Mexico of all places and one made in England which fizzled out real quick. But by heaven knows, I was a legitimate dealer. Now in those days, the 60s, uh, and starting into the early 70s, uh, there are Hap Jones, uh, Rose Cycle, um, uh, most of the really good distributors, you had to be a dealer of some kind. So it, it didn't have to be Harley Davidson or Triumph, but it could be a small dirt bike dealership. And so I had my letterheads made up, a friend's dad was a printer, and that's when some great American uh, distributors came along that sold to everybody. And I, I think that was a big help for the little garage shops that uh, you could buy exhaust systems, uh, racing parts, and that was a real big help to the, to the little guy. Um, and they came and went and so on. Now, Dennis Kirk is, is, is really amazing because of so many things. There's a variety of parts, the speed, the ease of order, you know, you pick up the phone and just whip out a part number and, and it's in your shop in a day or two. I'm Ed Fish and I'm from Torrenton, Pennsylvania and I'm a Dennis Kirk garage builder.